Okay, the reason I play like that, it's all right. The reason, thank you. Yeah. The reason I play like that is that to emphasize that this project is about 50% about technology and 50% about art. You cannot weigh it bending from one side or the other side. If you do that, you lose the goal, which is to move music forward. Um, so what's happening in music? From 2000 until today, for the last 15 years, sales in music getting lower and lower and lower. Actually, I don't think that's anybody that makes actual money from selling albums anymore, rather than maybe Taylor Swift. Uh, so what Quincy Jones said is that uh, the gene is not getting back to the bottle. Uh, that might be true. I'm, I'm not really sure. Maybe with innovation, the gene might go back in the bottle. So Taylor Swift, uh, a few months ago, removed her music from Spotify, a streaming service, because she wouldn't make any money if she had her music over there. And for Taylor Swift, this is okay, because for you know, very few artists we are, which are very famous, they can kind of make it, but for the majority of the artists all around the world, it's impossible for them to maintain their living, uh, their, their, you know, their average standards, without uh, by making music. So for them, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't work. I mean, the, if you search the internet and see the posts of people making it, and the desperation is not great, it's really, it's really bad what's happening. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that's a quote from Hans Zimmer, uh, 2014, and he says that uh, the industry knows that if we innovate, we can move things forward. So Hollywood is trying to innovate. All the places around the world that are doing professional music production or art uh, and entertainment, they try to move things forward really, really hard with every tool they have, with every idea they have. One of the things that, one of the tools that music producers and music professionals have in order to create immersive experiences is loudness. And IMAX is using that quite a lot. I mean, you, you, go, you go into an IMAX movie and you hear a, a message. You, it, the movie is about the message. So the actor says a quote and then you hear a large explosion. And the actor says another quote and then you hear a, a huge bass rumble underneath and your uh, seat is sh shaking and you're, you know, you you're feeling the, the waves hitting you, the, the loudness and the SPL. And that's a good tool, but it's not the right tool to use all the time. And one of the reasons that it's not the right tool is, first of all, not, not, not all the people are on an excessive loudness. It's not something that is psychoacoustically... Um, uh, acceptable for, 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 for the majority of people. It's impressive and it, you know, it can capture the audience. So, so for example, if I, right now, I want to uh, communicate a message with you. Imagine like every time I finish a sentence, then like an explosion happens from the speakers just to help emphasize the message. I mean, it's a good trick, but it's not actually you know, uh, elegant or actually helping music to move forward or helping entertainment to move forward. And one other thing that, that's happening is that that trick with the loudness is getting used by uh, mobile devices and people who design those devices. And instead of emphasizing in the sound quality of the mobile device or the headphone, all they do is that they try to turn it up to 11 and make sure that when a kid gets that uh, to their ears, that they're going to put it to 11 and it's going to sound awesome. And it's, you know, loudness, has, as I said again, it's a very nice tool and it sounds good. I mean, if you use it... Yeah properly. And what's happening is that you might go to a, to a show once and actually have a permanent hearing loss. Or if you use uh, your iPod at 11 all the time, your mobile device, you might also get that. And it's happening more and more. And that's very alarming because actually people are trying to um, promote music and what's happening is that the audience that they have in 10 years is going to be all deaf. So it's like defeating the purpose of what's happening. So what we're doing here, when you want to do something to music, you have to watch all the, all the spectrum of what's happening. And one spectrum is the creative side. The other spectrum is that what the audience uh, uh, gets from the awesome creative side. 
And the other thing that you have to take care of is at the same time, when you're doing things on the creative side and on the audience side, you have to make sure that you, you won't create health issues to your audience. And at, at the end of that, every, every step you take, you also have to make sure that you won't destroy music, like what, how it happened in the, in the early 2000s. That the internet exploded, but nobody really knew what they had to do with the MP3 and the download. And, and what's happened that it was an awesome technology, nobody really took in account the big picture and then music as, a, as an industry now suffers from all that. Again, another clip here. I love that one. Hit it, Joe! <laughs> Joe, I think we've got our viewers tuned in. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> what, what in the world is going on? Okay. <laughs> That's music technology. And it's awesome music technology. Based on mechanical engineering from the 50s, it's what Disney used in order to produce the music that we hear in, in all those 50s Disney things. It's, it's, it's really awesome. I mean... I don't think that there's a, a personal computer today, a workstation that can actually make that music and have that sound quality by using, you know, virtual reality and not sampling instruments here and there. So it's like, it's really, really awesome. On the other hand, it's like, when you see it, 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 it creates you a feeling that something is not right over there. And yeah, maybe. So that's from the 60s. And... Again, when I see that, uh, I, I have the same feeling that what's going on and why? And, okay, that's a recording studio that many, 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 many engineers would love to work. It's, it's a current photo for, from today. But again, you notice that all of the things that you see around is that actual technology of the 60s, the 70s, except for the Apple computer over there, the rest is 60s, 70s, and 80s technology. With the same kind of thing, you pull a plug, you put it over there, and you move on, and you have to maintain all that. That large format recording console that you see on the on the front, it's like close to a million dollar. So what what you see here is multi million dollar recording studio. And this is what Hans Zimmer says again about analog: go analog or go home. So there must be something. And what is it? It's that it sounds. Analog sounds good. It sounds better than what we th we have as a first incarnation of digital. Uh, so where we are with digital today? Here's another quote from Hans Zimmer. That's from a public post he made in 2012 and reposted it in 2015. And from all the text, I, I just pick up. I don't. It's not out of context. It's exactly what he's saying. So what he's describing here is that he takes few of the uh, virtual plugins we have that try to emulate analog gear. And he wonders how in the world people know how these virtual plugins should sound like if they never use the analog, the, the real gear. So he clearly states that the virtual plugin that people use inside the computer that supposedly emulates analog, it doesn't sound like the analog because people cannot get it. He cannot get it. Actually, nobody that has a real experience from analog gear can get what's happening. It's, it's not the same. It might, in few settings and if in, in certain loudness settings and, and in, in certain positions, might sound similar. But as you ask, start to analyze what's happening inside it, it's like it's, a, it's an emulation. It's not even a simulation of something. It's, it's a... There's... Uh, Software engineers, what they're trying to do, because they just have 
the CPU power and the core of the CPU as, as a tool on a workstation, what they're trying to do is that they take the code that's supposed to be the simulation and then start cutting corners in order to fit it to work on the CPU cycle thingy. That's what's happening today. Uh, and that's from another source. Um, that's a quote from one of my partners. I, I'm not putting his name because I didn't got his license, uh, his permission to use it here today. I, I didn't have the time. But what he shared with me is that he feels that we are, and th this is a cutting, cutting edge DSP developer from Germany. Like one of the plugins he makes, like state of the art DSP. And he said that we are, that the full analog emulation is out of the picture right now. And as I said, the reason is that all, all of the software developers, when they, when they begin a project to create a virtual uh, instrument or, or a virtual uh, emulator or simulate, emulator actually in that case of, of an analog gear, they know that they have to stay very, they have to use a small CPU power because they don't have unlimited inside the workstation. Okay, so I think that's like some sums up all of um, the, all of the things I'm saying. What we we need to do in order to move from those pictures I saw you of, of the awesome analog studio is to do component level simulation. We need to be able to do physical modeling of real instruments or plate reverb. A plate reverb is a, it's a it's actually a metal, a piece of metal that vibrates through the sound. So we need to actually physically emulate that, simulate that inside a computer in real time in order to get the sound of an actual a plate reverb. We also need to do actual room acoustics that not capture one, uh, one instance of a room, but actually uh, under, uh, si simulate how the room, uh, how, the ch how the sound changes while travels through the room in a three-dimensional space. All of these things need extreme amount of CPU power. One other thing is that there, most of them, I mean, there are, there are different cases there, but most of them are based on the single core CPU performance. So they're stuck in 2006 where, you know, we, we, we couldn't get more out of the CPU after that, from the single core. One other thing that is, it's kind of difficult for HPC2 is that you have to do all that and you have to do it in very low latency because musicians cannot wait for the thing to render. They, if they have an idea, they will, you know, start playing something on a string instrument or with a keyboard or with a piano with a keyboard, and then they, they want to keep adding and adding and adding. They don't want to wait for the, key, for the keyboard sound to render and then move on to the next one. That will actually make them lose their idea of composing music. Okay, so what's happening here? That's uh, a typical environment of, of uh, music production. Every instrument has to have different effects, compressors, equalizers, reverbs, tube simulators, uh, uh, solid state simulators, different things. And all of what we see now is like not, not more than a, um, an eight track machine. So these are 12 channels right now and a mastering channel. An eight-track machine is uh, the thing that Beatles actually, you know, work the, the most of their music on. And this right now runs on a workstation, and actually a very powerful workstation. That this was this, this this test I'm gonna show you uh, has been recording in real time. So what you see is a video, but the test is running in real time, and it's a four-core machine with a very high clock, uh, CPU clock speed. If I would use a CPU 
on that workstation that had more cores, it will be worse than what you would see because the cores will be clocked in a lower speed. So let's see what's happening here. The distortion you hear is a clipping from the CPU. It's not a clipping on the audio, that's a digital thing happening. The CPU cannot deliver the data in real time. And even though the, the system right now should, should be able to parallelize everything to different cores and work, but it's not happening. So we have four instruments and five equal equalizers and the system cannot play. You cannot make music with four equalizers and four instruments. You need compressors, you need all of the other plugins that I will add. So let's see what's happening. Of course, we're clocking a very low latency right now. So what's happening is that this, uh, the, uh, we ask from the CPU to deliver a very large amount of data in a very, very small amount of time. That's very CPU intensive. Now what I'm doing here is I'm changing the latency requirements to a, to a high latency, trying to give more time to the CPU to deliver the data, and it should play back. So I'm applying the setting. Now I, I suppose we don't demand so much from the CPU. The CPU has more time. But it's not playing yet. And we're just with Bell tracks in just 96 kilohertz, which is more, a little bit more than double that the CD audio quality. The same thing happens with every application. If every system, micro PC, doesn't matter, every operating system, it's an inherent problem of the design of the It's the same thing. Here. Same project, same settings, same plugin on an HPC environment. Not only can play it back. It can play back with an internal latency of measuring microseconds and not milliseconds at any sample rate, at any buffer size. We test it up to 1,500 kilohertz of sample rate, which is not necessary, but just to point out how much performance we can extract from the CPUs, from, from general paper CPUs using actual HPC. I want to emphasize again that that's not a problem of logic or the macro or anything what you saw. It happens on Nuendo, Samplitude, Sequoia, all those are software that people make music protection. It happens VN and Sample Pro, Pro Tools, FL Studio, Digital Performer, Between, everywhere. It's, it's the workstation and, and the way that plugins work that in relation to the workstation that is a problem. And, and the huge bottleneck there is this core CPU performance. Now, there are solutions in the market that say, okay, you cannot work with a workstation, so what are we going to do? We're going to give you dedicated DSP. You put it on your workstation and you work. Like, if you, and that's a good solution. It's, it's out there from the 90s, so it's not something new. But again, you have very, very limited processing power to do actual simulation. So it's not moving, it's not that solution. It's expensive and it's not moving forward. It's a custom thing. It's not a general purpose CPU. This is, so if, if, if I want to, you know, in, in a slide, so what's the market today for music? This is what's out there. The UAD is a dedicated DSP and it's about 19 gigaflops. You can see that graph. So that's more or less. The Mac Pro that I saw is actually really powerful machine and the Dell dual CPU workstation is even more powerful. So the, 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 the first and the third are dedicated DSP solution. I mean, 
you get it. I mean, hey, you know, you know what what's locked. Okay, what we did is we checked the cost per flop. And a very, very simple cluster with an i7 using a Mellanox InfiniBand, simple, you know, not, not the crazy card, but a simple card for HPC. Uh, it's 35 times more cost effective per flop than the industry standard today, which is DSP based solution. And we created the machine because we wanted, you know, we wanted for people to understand what we're doing and to be able to visualize it. So we created a, a case and we, uh, that we put in what we thought, what we think we music professionals should use today. We did some uh, thermal research and we have a solution. And this is how it looks. So it's like 200 times more power, real power compared to the industry standard solution today. And what I'm going to show you here is, uh, okay, that test is one stereo channel on 1,500 kilohertz played in real time. The equivalent general purpose CPU that we would need if we wouldn't use DS, uh, HPC in order to do that test will be 100 gigahertz. I get a synthesizer, I'm trying to create my sound. That's a that's a first step. Imagine that a song has a hundred instruments or two hundred instruments. Inception has a thousand channels. The movie that the soundtrack from the movie Inception has a thousand channels. So that's that's one stereo channel. And I'm starting creating a sound here. I add a compressor. All that is on a very high sample rate. But the point with the sample rate is that we demand a huge amount of data, it's in small ladies. We don't care about the frequency response of the sample rate. That's not the purpose of higher sample rate. That's all in real time. I'm going to the next, so I'm layering my sound. Try to make something interesting out of it. So it can give me inspiration to move on and maybe create a song. So we're layered few of the of, of DSP processes in the same channel. That's in the same thread that's happening right now in, in 1,500 kilohertz.
1.5 megapixels in real time. Of the polyphony, because you cannot play. I play three notes here, or four, and the, 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 the workstation cannot leave it. CPU clipping right now. And again, I'm on just 96 kilohertz right now, on a very low latency. I change that to give the CPU more time. Turn on in HPC mode, I can do whatever I want without many notes of polyphony as I want. It doesn't really matter. You can use 3000 at any sample rate. The HPC mode is not actually in 96 kilohertz. Again, I'm checking with the plugin. We're in 384 kilohertz, and it's easily, you know, it plays it like. That one is about rendering. So what what you want to do with rendering is, let's say that you want to render a very high quality sound. In a way, I render 10 seconds using a reverb in a very high quality setting and 10 seconds takes me 120 seconds. If I would use that, and you can see actually the parallel process happening on the workstation here. So if we would use a workstation and do that kind of sound quality to make a movie, the rendering of the entire soundtrack, it will take five years. Okay. Chorus in, in uh, right now I'm in 192 kilohertz and it took me, uh, you know, uh, from 10 seconds took me 120 seconds. With HPC, it doesn't matter. I can do it in 1.5 megahertz and it will be in real time. 
no matter how many tracks you have, no matter how many instruments you have, no matter how many notes of polyphony and musical ideas you have over there, it's always going to deliver it. Okay, that's why I told you about Inception. It will take five years to render in that sound quality or a Madonna album would take months, if not, if not years. One of the things we did is that this is a machine we, we created just to help people visualize it. But that's not the important part. Uh, the important part over here is the engine. That engine has been designed to be HPC from day one. And for that reason, it can be multi-core compatible and or it can use GPU. It is also compatible with all the ecosystem that is out there right now. And, sorry, I forgot that. And because it's designed in HPC environment from day one, it's cloud ready. And this is where the power is. That's why I don't want to fo focus on the one, you know, appliance over here of, of that thing that we designed. Okay, uh, HPC Music has, for, for many years now, we have partners from all around the world. These are a few of the best uh, audio DSP developers. And we, ha we keep the conversation going between us. We, we, they help me with their software to com compile tests and benchmarking and everything on, on the system to make sure what we design, it's actually applicable on the market today. That's not a lab kind of situation that we, we experiment with things. It could so one of the, we went on Namso uh, last week, and what, we have another partner, uh, Rob Pepin. His software has been used by artists and producers like Armin Van Buren, Jack King. So Jack King said we're going to produce the Batman vs. Superman movie soundtrack with Hans Zimmer, or he has users like uh, Rami Yacoub, who's the producer of Britney Spears and Bucks Boys and Celine Dion. One thing I want to clarify one more time is that we don't use sample rate to boost the frequency response. We use sample rate as a measurement to, I have zero seconds, I'm really ap apologize. One minute or two. We use sample rate as a measurement to emphasize that we can extract a huge amount of information from the CPUs of the cluster in a very, 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 very small amount of time. And that's really, really, really important. If somebody, if some of, my, of our software developers takes the technology and all the, he will do is just to uh, use it all to just to boost the uh, sample rate, that will be an epic failure for and misuse of the technology. We don't want to do that. That's not the goal. Um, yeah, we, I talk about that. What, where we want to move with HPC is do full-blown component-level based simulations of analog gear. A component by go component uh, simulation, plate reverbs, real physical modeling, and true room acoustic. Think of music right now, it's where graphics were in the early 90s. Doom, day. That's how it looks like today. A little exaggeration. We want to move to that. And HPC provides that platform for us. If we manage to move to that, we, we will be able to talk for digital audio 2.0 era for sound. Okay, thank you. <laughs>